All right. Let's see if we can't uh, wrap this thing up. Lecture 13. I think in the last video I actually said lecture 12. But it's lecture 13. And uh, I've just been talking about the Manhattan Project to build an atomic bomb. Could jump back into the original outline here and wrap this thing up. So here's two bombs. The bomb on the top is the uranium fueled bomb known as the little boy. I mean, these aren't the actual bombs or you know, similar bombs that someone took a picture of. I doubt they're the actual bombs. But anyway, the top bomb is the uranium gun type device, the uh, little boy. The bottom bomb is uh, the plutonium powered device, the fat man. This is what was being worked on with the Manhattan Project. All right, so after the defeat of Germany, the big three met one last time to talk about uh, you know mopping up loose ends with the defeat of Germany and to talk about what needed to be done uh, with Japan. Okay, and so here's the big three women, or is it? Well, something's changed here. All right. This guy is Harry Truman. He's the new president. He's replaced Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who had died. This, of course, is Joseph Stalin, the ruthless dictator who runs the Soviet Union. Well, who the heck is this? Well, this is Clement Attlee. He is the new Prime Minister of Great Britain. There has been an election uh, right after the end of war, and Winston Churchill's party has lost power in Parliament, and so the way the parliamentary system works, you'll get a new Prime Minister. So Churchill actually went to this meeting because they weren't necessarily sure yet how the elections were going to go out. So he went, and so there are pictures of Churchill at Potsdam. But uh, the new prime minister will be a guy named Clement Attlee. So we have Clement Attlee, A-T-L-E-E, -E, Harry Truman, and uh, Marshal Stalin, okay, Joseph Stalin. Uh, but no one considers these the big three. The big three is always Roosevelt, Stalin, and Churchill. Okay, so this is like big three, mark two. Okay. Ah. And uh, they're talking about you know what's going to be done next and you know how are things are going to go with Japan and all this stuff. Okay. While Truman is at Potsdam, he gets word from the United States a report that the scientist at Los Alamos has successfully test fired. The gadget. The gadget is, of course, the atomic bomb. Now, the Manhattan Project was so secret that Harry Truman did not even know about it when he was vice president. Okay, uh, he had only been vice president uh, for about three months because Roosevelt had a different vice president on his third term. Okay, uh, so Truman's only been vice president from January through April when Roosevelt dies, and suddenly he's president, and that's when they told him about the Manhattan Project. It was that secret, but even the vice president didn't really need to know about it. So word comes, while Truman's at Potsdam, that the bomb has been successfully exploded, and he discusses it you know, with the other leaders. Stalin supposedly said, I hope you know what to do with that thing. Okay. And so they issue the Potsdam Declaration. Okay, uh, Potsdam is in Germany. Okay, that's where they were meeting. They issue the Potsdam Declaration, telling the Japanese they need to surrender. They need to surrender immediately. They need to surrender unconditionally, or that Japan will face unbelievable destruction. Okay, so they issue a, a warning, an ultimatum, a declaration that the Japanese need to surrender. Okay. Well, the Japanese don't surrender. Now, there's, there's people in Japan who are you know, putting out peace feelers for neutral third world countries. There's, there's certainly people who think that, uh, you know, it's time to end this thing. Uh, but, you know, the military is very, very strong in Japan. Uh, they're determined to fight this thing out. Uh, the people who are advocating for peace are in a minority. They're not in powerful positions. And so, in August... Uh, a bomber will take off from the Marianas Islands. 
So on, uh, the date is August 6th, by the way. On August 6th, a B-29 superfortress named the Enola Gay takes off uh, from Tinian, if I recall, which is one of the Marianas Islands. Uh, destination Hiroshima. I've also heard it pronounced Hiroshima. I don't speak Japanese. Of course, it's anglicized anyway. But the point is, the Enola Gay drops the little boy uranium-powered gun-type bomb on Hiroshima, devastating the city, causing massive casualties. Here's a picture of Nagasaki, what's left of it. Uh, this has been signed by Paul Tibbetts. He was the pilot of Enola Gay. Tibbetts lived a really long time. He only died oh, like in the last 10 or 20 years. Uh, to his dying day, people would ask him, you know, do you regret dropping the atomic bomb on Hiroshima? And he would go, nope, ended the war. Well, but, but thousands and thousands of people were killed. Yep, it was horrible. Ended the war. That was kind of how he looked at it. Uh, devastates the city. All right? uh, so we wait. Incidentally, uh, how many times have the little boy bomb been tested? Never. We only had one of them. Uh, they didn't have enough uranium ready to build a second bomb right. And they eventually could have built a second one. But when they were testing the bomb, they tested the plutonium bomb because it was more experimental. It was a more sophisticated design. And the engineers looked at the uranium bomb and said, this thing's going to work. And it did. Uh, so we dropped a bomb on Hiroshima, levels the city, and what happens? Well, the Japanese notice that you know a city has gone off the air. You know they've lost communication. Uh, they're concerned about it, but honestly, the Army Air Force has been bombing Japanese cities into oblivion for about six months. Okay. Uh, we had firebombed Tokyo in the spring of 1945, burned out square miles of the city with incendiary devices. It took a lot of airplanes to do it, but we did it. Uh, difference in Hiroshima just takes one bomb. So cities being leveled are not exactly new to the Japanese. Okay? But what does give them something else to think about is after we drop the bomb on Hiroshima, the Soviet Union declares war on Japan and goes into action against Japanese forces operating in China. Now I grew up in the Cold War when the Soviet Union was the enemy and we always kind of looked at it like, well geez, you know, uh, there you go, we drop an atomic bomb and the Soviets rush in at the last minute to try to get some, uh, pick up some spoils, get some credit. And there's probably a little bit of truth to that, but what had Stalin promised to do back at Yalta? He said that when Germany surrendered, he would enter the war against Japan and they needed three months. Okay? Germany surrenders on May 8th. May to June, June to July, July to August. Stalin has kept his word. He's right on target. Okay? Now, uh, and so the Japanese war councils meet and uh, they talk about this. Well, gosh, the Soviets have uh, declared war on us. So, oh great, that's something new. Well, and something's missing. Something's wrong with Hiroshima. You know, it's been bombed. Well, that's not new. So, they're looking at the the situation, uh, trying to figure out what to do. Now, we know what they don't do. They don't get on the radio and broadcast a clear signal to everybody saying we want to surrender. So, just to make sure that the Japanese get the point, three days later, on August 9th, another B-29 takes off from Tinian. This time carrying the Fat Man bomb, the plutonium bomb. Uh, this B-29 is called the Boxcar. Boxcar. That looks like an odd word. It's a play on words. The pilot was Mr. Bock, B-O-C-K, although he wasn't flying a plane that day. I won't go into that, but so he... Box, Mr. Box, plural apostrophe, not plural, uh, possessive apostrophe, S, box car. It's a play on words for the railroad car, the box car, something that carries heavy, heavy uh, cargo, right? So, box car, 
boxcar. Boxcar. Takes off. Destination where? Kokura. Kokura. But they get to Kokura and it's socked in with bad weather. Under clouds, you can't see well, and so the boxcar diverts to the secondary target of Nagasaki and another Japanese city evaporates. Nagasaki is often called the forgotten bomb, but I guarantee you the people of Nagasaki have not forgotten. Okay. Well, now after this uh, one-two punch, two cities have been destroyed in three days, and the entry of the Soviet Union into the war of a Japanese emperor goes, that's it, that's enough, we've got to end this thing, I'm not going to see my country destroyed. And so Japan sends out word that they will surrender to the Allied forces. And they send this out on August 14th, which becomes known as VJ Day, for victory in Japan, and there was much rejoicing. Uh, you know, people lining the streets, barking. There's this famous photo. Some uh, some sailor grabs a nurse on that he doesn't know and just plants her a big kiss because he's happy because he won't have to go fight in Japan. All right. They spend decades trying to figure out who these two were. They've got some. They think they know, but they the photographer at the time didn't get their names. And people for years are saying it was so and so or such and such. I kissed a nurse that day. There were probably lots of sailors kissing nurses that day. Uh, but anyway, people are very, very happy about the war being over. The Japanese will formally surrender aboard the battleship Missouri on 2nd of September 1945, which is six years and a day since the Germans invaded Poland on September 1st, 1939. Japanese delegation arrives on board the ship. It's in the is anchored in Tokyo Bay. There's a formal ceremony. Uh, Douglas MacArthur, who I told you is always a bit of a showboater, uh, reads a speech. Uh, Admiral, Admiral, well, Admiral Nimitz is there from Texas. He signs uh, Vince from a surrender. And, you know, if, if, if someone from Great Britain signs, if a Japanese sign, and you know, Soviet Union signs, everybody signs. And MacArthur goes up to the microphone and says, Gentlemen, these proceedings are closed. The war is over. <laughs>